Elijah message is found in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says there will be turning of hearts before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So this heart turning is work that God is going to do before the second coming of Jesus Christ. The name Malachi means my messenger. In the book of Malachi, the people had not only abandoned their covenant with God, they had also abandoned their family covenants. For this reason, the book of Malachi looks back to the time when Elijah the prophet confronted the altars of Baal worship and rebuilt the altar of Jehovah, the one true God. Elijah had to restore the broken altars and teach the people how to worship again. The children of Israel had forgotten who the true God was. So Elijah sought to restore their memory of the last lecture of Moses, where they were reminded of the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart. 1 Kings 18, 36-37 tells us, Elijah begins a prayer by acknowledging the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the God his fathers worshipped. Elijah prays, let it be known that you are God in Israel. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. The most miraculous part of this story is the extravagant love of God for his people. When the fire fell, in verse 38, it consumed the burnt offering, not the people. Despite the sinfulness of the people, God does not destroy them, but gives them an opportunity to repent and turn their hearts to Him and to their children and others. When we make our way back to God, there must always be a heart turning. The Elijah message is even more consequential and relevant to the survival of our families today. This powerful and miraculous story helps us to better understand from a biblical and psychological perspective what is needed in our homes today just as was needed in the days of Noah, Moses, and Elijah. And that is for parents to teach their children diligently to love the Lord with all their hearts, as we read in Deuteronomy 6, 4-8. This was a command from Moses to the children of Israel, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. It is an urgent plea to parents that their most important task is to teach their children to love and worship God, Jehovah, the one and only true God. We believe that Jesus is coming again, and he's coming soon. The altar that needs to be rebuilt today is the family altar of worship, what we currently refer to as family worship. Elijah had to rebuild, repair, and restore the altar of the Lord that had been torn down and lost because the people had turned their attention, their focus, and their worship to other gods and false prophets. In many ways, our families today are doing the same as in the days of old. We are bombarded daily by competing commitments that don't leave much time or space for worshiping God. Understandably, our schedules are packed with many wonderful and noble activities. And while many may profess that time with God is important, it doesn't actually make it into their schedules. Subconsciously, family worship or time with God appears postponable. Some parents are still traumatized from strict, long, and boring worships from their childhoods and are reluctant to do the same with their children, while other parents simply don't know what to do or how to do family worship and many parents feel some guilt because they want to have family worship, but are just not sure how to move forward. The only way to ensure that family worship will take place is to put family worship in our schedules, not as a burden, but as something so critical to our spiritual survival that it must be a non-negotiable no matter what. It must be a priority. We must ensure to put first things first. Because whatever is most important to us should always be included in the schedule first. Knowing that everything else may come after that, it may mean making adjustments in our daily routines so that the most critical priorities are never left out of our daily routines. Rebuilding the family altar in our homes means that there should be some heart turning taking place. 
and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Successful and positive family altar experiences in our homes begin with love, warmth, patience, kindness, all the fruit of the spirit. Ellen White tells us in the book Child Guidance, the children are to be instructed with kindness and patience. Let the parents teach them of the love of God in such a way that it will be a pleasant theme in the family circle. Family worship has psychological as well as spiritual benefits. Family worship is a time for family bonding and building good relationships. It serves as a protective factor for our children. Family scientists tell us that families that spend meaningful time together help their children stay away from risky behaviors. Worship time is a time of forming family attachments and creating a safe environment for children and for all the members of the family. It is time set aside to pass on to our children our legacy of faith. It is a time to teach our children how to worship God. It is a time to remind our children of the Creator God who loves them, who has a magnificent plan for their lives, and who wants to save them in His coming kingdom. Family worship is protective armor from a hostile world. If done in the context of love, family worship equips our children with positive and warm memories that promote good mental health, spiritual fortitude, and a healthy self-esteem. Once we have established the importance of family worship in our families, we need to ask, what are the altars of Baal inside and outside our homes today that need to be overcome so that God's altar can be restored? What we know for sure is that children and parents are being confronted by hostile influences and divergent views which are taking our focus away from God and the family. Social media, mobile devices, time pressures, gaming, busy schedules, and other unique stressors are crowding out the family's time for daily praise and worship of God, thus leaving our children and families exposed to the wiles of the enemy. Make no mistake, Satan is in a battle with God for control of our minds. The more our minds are directed away from God, the more difficult it is for us to worship God and to hear His voice. However, God created us with the capacity to control our minds or brains and to use what neuroscientists call brain plasticity or neuroplasticity to scan what is harmful to us and train our brains to build positive patterns. The best way to do this is to expose ourselves more to God's Word and the ways of God and by eliminating or reducing those elements which threaten to move our minds away from God. A final step in rebuilding the family altars in our homes is to reframe how we view family worship, especially if family worship has been a bad experience of the past or family worship has seemed out of reach for your family. Here's where neuroplasticity comes in again. Our brains or minds believe what we tell them. So we must begin to think positive thoughts towards family worship and believe that we are able to engage in family worship regularly. Just like we tell ourselves we need to brush our teeth or to eat or to go to school. Again, if it is important and we view family worship as essential to our survival, we will make sure family worship is practiced in our homes. Here are a few helpful ways to better understand family worship. First, let's look at what family worship is not. A Sabbath sermon or preaching service or Sabbath school. It's not. Time for, dis for discipline and using the Bible as a way of correction or reproof. Not during family worship. A lecture or coercive activity. It's not. And it's not entertainment. So, what is family worship? Family worship is interactive. Family worship has participatory leadership. Everyone should get involved. Family worship should be brief and engaging. Emphasis on brief. 
In fact, Ellen White says there is no reason why family worship should not be the most interesting and enjoyable exercise of the home life. And God is dishonored when it is made dry and irksome. Let the seasons of family worship be short and spirited. There's no prescription for how family worship should be looking in your home. Every family can shape family worship in the way that fits best for their family. As long as God is at the center of your worship, you are on the right track. Twice per day is recommended. However, you may begin by having family worship once per day. If that is where you're, you need to begin or restart the practice of family worship. Our homes are desperately in need of hope, healing, and heart turning. There's a yearning for connection with the only one who can bring peace to our hearts and to our homes. We must rebuild Jehovah's altar in our homes. To restore or rebuild the altar is to make Jesus Christ central in our homes, in our hearts, and our minds, and allow our lives to be daily intersected by the heart-turning love of God. It was needed in Elijah's day. And it is needed even more today. God, God bless you. you.